that um, we can pray in unity, we can uh, come into agreement with the word, and it's just like you're with me and I'm with you because we certainly are. So I want you to know with that being said, I was worshiping as I do every week right along with you um, for the songs that you sang this morning and uh, we'll close with one also today. So um, I think Jeanette probably told you we had a relentless announcement we were going to make today, but um, Teresa had a little family situation that um, put forth her not being able to be here. So we don't want to do that without her being there. And especially for the evening class, because um, she was going to do the soul announcement in the evening. So we'll just hold off until next week, but you come ready to uh, engage and ready to unify with where we're going to go with Relentless for 2024. So I'm just wondering, uh, one of the times that we gather, I love our small group time because I just love how we get around that table and discuss, uh, you know, some pertinent things, take some things from the message and be able to, you know, apply them to our life. So I'm wondering, and I'm just wondering how this might even work. I can see it on Facebook. I can't see it where we are, but you had a question that was um, preparation yourself, pack your packing list, I guess you could say, um, in the aspect of preparation for Jesus' return, preparation for, you know, all that we have been studying and seeing. And I'm just wondering if anyone is brave enough to come forward and so I can hear what was it you talked about in your group what you know was there something that stood out in one of your group times that um, you want to share or with the rest and me too um, or that someone else maybe said that just impacted you so get get a mic Steve will give you one so I can hear what you're saying um, I mean, I would love to love to just hear that, love to see, love to hear what you discussed last week. So I'll be quiet for a second and you can go ahead and do that. I see Marge looking around. She's probably trying to find a hand up because you're being shy. But somebody, you did have group time last week, right? Yes. Okay. They don't remember? Well, let me ask the question again. What, what are you doing in your life that is preparing you for Jesus' return? In other words, what are you embracing in a greater measure or what has to go that is interfering with your discipleship and your devotion and your, you know, walk with him? Okay, Marianne, great. Let me see if I can hear her. Um, okay, what signpost? do we see that tells us the stage is being set for what we studied today? Uh, well, the world system, uh, it's their view, which is the devil's view, to push their agenda, um, the new world order, the churches, some churches are teaching doctrines of devils, and the falling away. Okay, I, I heard that pretty good. How about somebody personally? Is there something the Holy Spirit has laid on your heart that maybe, you know, you're doing or that needs to go, that more room needs to be made? Okay, hi, it's me again. Um, okay. <laughs> well, all of me has to go and all of Jesus has to be in, in me. Well, that's that's true. That is very true. Um, anything specific? Uh -oh. Who's up? Doris. Yes. Hey, Doris. Sending a hug. Hey, Pastor. It's good to see you. Um, I was looking at, the, it's the second page of our study last week where it's number 12. Name the scripture that tells us how beast comes into power. Uh, I didn't fill in the blanks there because... I was trying to pay attention to what you were saying. But okay. As far as I know, and I learned that the power and authority that I have over the enemy, 
And then when I see something attacking me, I can use that power and I can use that authority to, as the enemy flee, the enemy goes away. It just encouraged me more and more about the power and the authority that we had. I think I repeated myself, but twice. But <laughs> what was that last part, Marge? Okay. Okay. Well, I hope that, you know, you will take some of these questions and things that we pose in the small group seriously, because, you know, there's something in every one of our lives. Okay, good. Who's up? Okay. Hi, Pastor. Nice and loud, Michelle. Yeah, I uh, just, it's simple but it's been replayed and replayed throughout our study of revelations is have ears to hear. Mm, and, amen. Um, God has just been honing and just sensitizing my ears even more and more and more. So, but that takes time taking more time with him and, um, yes. yeah, simple, but I just feel like that has been his, his, um, command through okay. revelation so far. Good. Okay. Okay. Well, again, I hope that um, I hope that the book is impacting all of us. Um, me too, with you. Just, wow. I mean, if we will never be able to stand before the Lord and say, you know, I, I just really didn't know you were coming so soon and just didn't know, you know, we are now really educated um, in the Bible as to the times and seasons we live in. And today's lesson is just striking to me. It actually has just caused me to really have a sorrow in my heart because there's really going to be people my sisters that have heard the gospel but have decided oh I'll just wait you know I, I don't want to give up this or that and um they're going to go through this time that is just treacherous and again what we're going to learn about today is we focus mostly on the false prophet um is just a time that's just, you can't even imagine what it will be like during that time. But anyway, I want to just jump right in. Let's pray. And then we're going to go ahead and we're going to finish chapter 13 today. Um, not going to start 14. So I'm not sure we might be done a little early. Probably not, but <laughs> we'll try for that. I'm going to start 14 out fresh when we gather uh, again next week. So let's just pray. So Father... We come into your glorious presence. We just give you praise and honor, Lord, that, you know, you are not a distant God, that you call us to your side. You call us to your heart. You want to conform your thoughts to our thoughts so we will know your perfect will in our lives. And so right now, Lord, we just become a, a sacrifice unto you, a bodily sacrifice. We lay down our mind. We lay down anything that we're carrying that is causing anxiousness, anything that's causing us to be despondent or depressed, anything that is not of you. We just, we just cast our care to you right now, Lord, and we just um, receive your joy, the joy of, you, of your salvation in us. And even though these are tough and just difficult chapters to go through and to, to digest spiritually, yet on the other side, we know that all this comes to an end and the bride and the groom have a wonderful, wonderful unity that comes, Lord. And we look forward to that day. We say Maranatha, not at the end of the service today, but even at the beginning, how amazing it would be to be in Bible study and for you just to return while we have this glorious book um, full of wonderful promises and full of your imagery laying on our laps. So we say, come, Lord Jesus. Um, if you should tarry, we, I submit my tongue, mouth, mind to you, 
that Holy Spirit, you would speak what uh, needs to be said today um, and that Jesus would be glorified. And we ask it all in your precious name, Lord Jesus. And everyone said, amen. Okay, well, Revelation 13 brings us right into the timeline of the tribulation, as you know. Um, we were about halfway, not only through the book of Revelation, but we're about halfway through the tribulation, too. Uh, we know that in the Bible, Revelation, that the tribulation is in chapter 6 to 19. So you can see we're right in the middle as we look at it from a chapter and text standpoint. But we also, from a timeline spiritually, are about in the middle of things. If you remember, chapter 12, we looked at um, the explanation of um, God's redemptive plan through a woman, which we said was Israel, and a child, which we said was Jesus Christ, that needed to be redeemed from a dragon whose name is Satan. And so now in this chapter, what it really is all about is the increase and in heightened opposition to that redemptive plan uh, by the dragon and the beast, which is the power is given from the dragon to this beast. We know in chapter 13, we spent time last week looking at this, that there's two um, characters that emerge out of chapter 13. The beast is spoken of a beast that arises out of the sea. And then we're today going to see a beast that arises from the earth. And his name is the false prophet. So where the book of Revelation says the beast of the sea and the beast of the earth, we know for practicality purposes, and as we get further in the book of Revelation, they'll be called different names. So basically what we're looking at in the first part of chapter 13 is the Antichrist, the second part, the false prophet. Um, the beast, we talked last week, um, eventually, and his onus and his uh, desire and plan and mission is to be the global dictator and exactly what will happen. The false prophet, however, walks in, works in tandem with him, but not as a global dictator per se, but as a global religious leader. So you see we have the political and the religious kind of with synergy coming together, and it's quite the demonic duo, and these are the two villains, if you will, of chapter 13. Between the two, they're going to work together, but they're not going to work in their own power. They are empowered by the dragon, um, and the power is, is, is given to them. Why? Because the, the dragon wants to advance his own agenda, which is to do away with Christ, you know, stop his second coming, and to defile everything that God loves, which is you and I which is the church, which is the bride. So again, the chapter is divided into two parts. Verses 1 through 10 speak of this beast that arises from the sea or the Antichrist. And then what we're going to focus mainly on today is verses 11 through 18, which is the narrative on the false prophet. So last week we uncovered the Antichrist, but there's a scripture I want to go back to. If you remember um, when we closed this week, I said we would still be looking at uh, some of his character traits and whatnot. And I didn't really spend any time in this particular verse. So let's go back, push reverse a little bit. I want to look at chapter 13, verse 3. And that is something that has a lot to do as we enter into the latter part of the chapter. So verse 3 says, John said, I saw one of his heads as if it had been mortally wounded. Now, we were talking here about this beast that arises from the sea, and he had these heads and these crowns and horns upon them. But John says he saw one of these heads that had been mortally wounded and the deadly wound. So this is this is a fatal injury that's taking place, okay, uh, based on the scripture. This deadly wound was healed, and all the world marveled and followed the beast. So what is this? What is this? Well, earlier in the chapter in verse one, again, we learned that the beast had seven heads and we decided that these seven heads, as we look back at Daniel, we talked about the 10 nation confederation already being formed and, and communication taking place European wise. But we looked at it, it, what it said. It said there were seven heads. 
And it didn't necessarily mean a certain country. What it really was referring to was global power and authority, which is why we know the Antichrist will be the global dictator. Um, it tells us one of these seven heads received a wound. And we just read here it was deadly. It was a mortal wound. Now, we have learned that if you want to understand Revelation, you have to go back to other places in the word. And here, if we go back to the Old Testament, we can get a little further insight into what this might be. Now, I want to say up front that there definitely, I'm dropping my notes here, that there definitely is some debate here as to what this might be, what it involves. But we do know that it's a wound. We know it's fatal from Scripture itself. Most believe, most believe, most that you would follow, uh, people you would follow. I think of David Jeremiah. I think of uh, just so many that probably are very, David Jeremiah does an amazing job in the book of Revelation. But um, most believe that it is an assassination attempt that causes the wound. Uh, and it kind of, as you, if you think of the scenario with what's going on as we've studied, that would make sense that, you know, this an evil guy is showing up and beginning to take over. So an assassination attempt isn't that far-fetched for us to go with. Um, so many believe that. Most believe that this assassination attempt will have some success, but not totally, because apparently he is resurrected and healed, as we just read. So therefore probably was fatal as we just read what this says because he's again healed and miraculously raised verse 3 tells us so let's take a look going backwards and get a little more insight into the old testament book of zechariah zechariah 11 to be exact um and i didn't mark that and should have zechariah 11 uh, 15 to 17 is where we're going to go. 11, 15 to 17. And it says, And the Lord said to me, Next, take the implementation of the foolish shepherd. Remember last week we talked about that's one of the names of the Antichrist, according to Zechariah. And indeed, I will make up a shepherd in the land who will not care for those who are cast off, nor seek the young, nor heal those that are downtrodden, nor feed those that will not stand. But he will eat the flesh of the fat and tear down the hooves in pieces. Woe to the worthless shepherd who leaves the flock a sword shall, are you ready for this? A sword shall he be against his arm, it says, against his arm, and against his right eye. His arm shall completely wither, and his right eye shall be totally blinded. Very interesting. If you do a little research into this, you'll find that some believe that maybe there's a, a shooting that takes place, and there's a head injury, probably to the right eye. And if you have any medical background, you know that sometimes when there's an injury to one side of the brain, the opposite side of the body is affected. So whether there's some stroke that takes out of this or injury to the right side of this, uh, the antichrist brain, that it causes uh, a lameness in the left side where we see the withering of this left arm. Very interesting. But when it says here in Zechariah to the foolish Shepherd, it means wicked. In the Hebrew, it's the word wicked. So he's blinded in his right eye, his arm is withered by what? It says a sword, but you know, remember John is seeing a vision. There were no guns then. So what is it that John is seeing? We don't really know for sure, but some kind of an attempt to assassinate this beast or the Antichrist happens. But the injury he sustains is so severe we know that when he recovers from it, it will be enough. The recovery and what happens out of it will be so amazing for people to see and so fantastic. And the whole world is going to see it, that people will look at this situation and they're going to worship him. They're going to worship him. Look at 
back in Revelation, look at verse, well, let's look at three and four together. And I saw one of the heads as if it had been mortally wounded and his deadly wound was healed. See again, his deadly wound. And all the world marveled and followed the beast. Why? Well, let's look at verse four. So they worshiped the dragon who gave authority to the beast and they worshiped the beast saying, who was like the beast? Who was able to make war against him? So this, this guy recovers miraculously from this mortal injury. I mean, this, this sounds like a science fiction movie, doesn't it? Or something you'd see on, you know, Law and Order or something. I mean, this is really amazing to just be reading this and, and imagining this time taking place. And people will say, this guy is amazing. Look at him. He is like God. And the word says that they'll worship They'll worship both the beast and the dragon. And of course, we read in verse four that it's the dragon that gives power, right, to that beast. And in a moment, bear with me, we're going to see the false prophet enter in who has been in the stage all along. But now John is going to give us insight into him, this global religious leader where he's going to fan the flame of all of this evil idolatry. He's going to be the flame, the oxygen, if you will, behind all of this evil idolatry. In fact, let's look at verse 8. Verse 8 in chapter 13 says, all who dwell on the earth will worship him. Are, are, are you seeing what I'm saying? All, all who worship, all who dwell on the earth will worship him whose names have not been written in the book of life or the book, the, the Lamb's book of life, slain from the foundation of the world. So what, what is going on here? Well, the tribulation saints apparently won't worship the beast. So John makes this distinction that the whole world is going to worship this miraculous healing that takes place that apparently is deadly and 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 fatal but something takes place this healing this miraculous healing takes place that causes a resurrection if you will and, and i can't help but take a moment right now and say do you see once again satan and his counterfeit uh copycat ways you know jesus was resurrected jesus received more mortal wounds if you will so everything that the dragon slash Satan does, it, you know, there's always a mimic, there's a mimic to try to copy God in, in every aspect of what he's doing. So it, it, the tribulation saints aren't going to worship the beast, apparently. And unfortunately, the consequence of that is going to be their martyrism. They're going to be martyred for not worshiping this beast. You'll see as we get through the end of the chapter. I would love for you to touch your neighbor right now and say, don't wait, get saved now. Facebook, I'm talking to you too. Don't wait. Why would you wait? I think people just feel like, you know, why I can wait for to the tribulation and have fun. You, you don't they don't realize that having fun is is not worth going through the tribulation. And what's fun anyway, apart from God? All you do is set yourself up for a demonic attack in your life because Satan is not liking anybody, okay? He just wants evil to run rampant, and he wants to use especially God's people to do it. So really, touch your neighbor and say, don't wait, get saved now. Facebook, I want you to write in the comment area, get saved today. Go ahead and write that in the comment area so everybody can see it. Get saved today. Amen? It's not worth waiting for. This is going to be such a, wow, you think that it's evil now, and it is. This is this is child's play compared to what's coming. And you are going to be, people will be hunted down. And we're going to talk before this day is over about a mark that's going to be placed. And they're going to be looking for that mark. And if you don't have it, and you won't worship the dragon empowering the beast, you will be taken out. So let's now, I want you to see where, where a lot of the 
oxygen for all this is coming from. Beginning in verse 11 of the chapter, chapter 13, it says, Then, John says, I saw another beast. I saw another beast coming up from out of the earth. And he had two horns like a lamb. Very interesting. Lambs don't have horns. Okay. But again, this counterfeit deception with people to try to mimic what God has done. So he had two horns like a lamb, but yet he spoke like a dragon. You know, I, I wish I had time to go down this path a little bit, but, you know, let's not be lambs who speak like dragons. Because, see, that's confusing. Jesus said our words ought to be exactly like his words. In fact, he said, I don't say anything. Unless I say what my father says, I'll tell you that is a that is a mission of mine in life. You know, this mouth just wants to say what it wants to say. It's the it's the trap that the flesh uses to vent, right? Well, we don't always have to vent everything. And this this other dragon that has come up out of the earth is like a lamb. In fact, two is the number for a witness. But yet its mouth is like a dragon. I want to say here also in the very beginning of the verse, it says, I saw another. That word another in the Greek is the word alos, A-L-O-U-S. And it means another of the same kind. So this is like the Antichrist is what John's trying to tell us here. Notice that the alos came up from the earth, not the sea. The Antichrist came from the sea. This came from the earth. I want you to know that in the book of Revelation, when we when we see the word something coming out of the sea, and when it's talking about that, almost always, without fail, it refers to humanity. And that's exactly what the Antichrist will do, because the sea means coming out of humanity. Antichrist will come up from the nations. He will come up from the nations. We're not sure exactly whether... It's Jewish. We talked about that last time, whether it's uh, Arab. There's so much speculation about it. But when we see in the book of Revelation, having did something coming up out of the water, it most always refers to humanity. The false prophet here is coming up out of the earth, which means he is coming up out of, out of a very worldly system. And I want to tell you up front, the system that he's coming up from and bringing into the tribulation days is a worldly religious system. Now let's stop right there because I had to stop in my study. So I want you to stop with me. There it is. We have that in play now. You know, like if you go to a church like ours that really believes every ounce of what God said from gender, you know, uh, security in the word of God to um, your money, to what you say, uh, to where you'll go and where you won't go. You know, there'll be people say, oh, you know, that's just old fashioned. You don't have to abide by that anymore. See, the the, the world system has already entered the church. It's the, the makeup, the stage is already set for it. I, I wish I was there because I'd love to just chat with you through the mic about some examples that that might, you, that might come to your mind. But exactly what's happening is this, this, this beast which is, is the same of, an, of another kind, he's another of the same kind, I should say, is going to put forth a religious world system. So now we have unifying in one chapter a global worldly dictator, evil, and now we're seeing the convergence together of a worldly religious system coming right there. It says he has two horns. That's the number of testimony. It says he's like a lamb. And interesting, religious testimony. Why? Because lambs were used in Hebrew sacrifice. So he's, again, he's using some of these play on words and his presentation being deceptive. This is Jews right now. The tribulation is about that last-ditch effort to save those that are lost, but it's also about bringing the Jews into a saving relationship with Yeshua. So, so what he's using these kinds of visuals that the Jew would, would understand. He comes across religious, 
but his practices are deceptive. That's why we see that he speaks like a dragon, okay? Comes across religious, the lamb, right? But he's he comes, his religious system is deceptive. It's exactly what it is. Why? Because Satan's behind him. Satan's behind everything. So verse 12, let's look at that. It says, and he exercises all the authority of the first beast. So the first beast we know was who? Antichrist, right? So this false prophet or the second beast exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence and causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. So John wants us to see again this, this pseudo miracle that took place empowered by Satan himself, right? And the second beast that emerges he gets his authority from the first beast, and he's the oxygen that causes the world to go ahead and to worship him. Okay, that's exactly what he's doing. And he's drawing a false worship to the Antichrist. I believe that's one of the blanks on your study guide. He's drawing false worship, fanning, you know, demonic oxygen, if you will, upon the world so that false worship will come upon the Antichrist. Listen. Let's let's put our reminding hat on. If, I think this is just so simple to see. Satan from the very beginning wanted the worship. He wanted worship. And so in these last days, he's still after that. And here for a very short season, it looks like he finally gets what he's been after. But he doesn't know the end is yet, not yet here. Somebody say amen to that. Um, can't you just hear it? Can't you just hear it? Worship the beast. Worship the beast. Worship the beast. Worship the beast. That is going to be the echoing of, of the voice of the false prophet everywhere in nations and globally and worldwide. Worship the beast. Worship the beast. He's hungry for worship. And this false prophet is going to be his his, his Robin to the Batman, if you will, to accomplish that. Notice, too, that it's a fatal wound. But again, it's repeated here in the verse that he comes alive again. Church, I want you to know it's a counterfeit resurrection. This is all counterfeit. All of it. And apparently, the false prophet has something to do with this counterfeit resurrection. And I say that because of verse 13. Let's look at that together. It says he performs. Now, this whole area, 11 to 18, is all about the false prophets. When you see he, we're talking about the false prophet. It says he performs great signs. And so that even he even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. He performs great signs, even causing fire to come down from heaven. Who in the Old Testament had fire come down from heaven? I think it's going to be on the screen any second. Elijah. Elijah, right? See, do you see this counterfeit usage of things from the Old Covenant, things from the past that Jews would relate to, that would trick them, that would deceive them? So what is he doing? He's mimicking this famous um, Old Testament prophet because it's all deception before the people. All of it. All of it. Now, that's a church you want to avoid, isn't it? Verses 14 and 15 says, and he deceives those who dwell on the earth. He deceives those who dwell on the earth by those sights which he has granted to do in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and yet lived. This is the third time we see the vernacular there that he's talking about. He was granted power to give breath to the image. Do you hear this? He's going to create some kind of image, and he's given power from Satan to, to, to allow breath to come into the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak. Do you, do you see this? 
both speak and cause many, as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. This is a cumulation of really the whole middle portion of the, the tribulation that takes place. This is a church you want to avoid. This is a church you want to avoid. But it's only the beginning how he will enforce this deceptive evil system that will take place. I want to look, I want to just go back to Matthew. I didn't give this to Morge, but I, I, I'm thinking of it right now. And I want to find it because I just, Holy Spirit's bringing it to my remembrance. So Matthew 24, um, we know, speaks of Jesus uh, on the Mount of Olives speaking to his disciples when they ask him, you know, when will the end times come and how will we know about it? And Jesus goes through and, hey, you know, read through this, you know, just often because it's, this is Jesus speaking about what we're studying about in Revelation. But in particular, now let me just find it. Um, in particular, he talks about in the end days. Uh, da, 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 da. Yeah, verse 21. For then there will be great tribulation, much that has never been seen since the beginning of the world or times, and, and nor ever shall be. So this is not like some little thing. This is times that never were, Jesus said, or never shall be. And then listen to this. And unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. Well, I think it's two things this, this election is talking about. It's talking the elect, meaning the tribulation saints. But don't forget, the tribulation is about Jacob's trouble. So it's about saving Israel too, right? So it, it deals with both things. And then in verse 23, it says, Then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or there, do not believe it. And here, here's what I wanted to bring to your attention. For false Christs, chapter 13, verses 1 through 10, for false Christs and false prophets. He wasn't just talking about people walking around today prophesying things that don't come to pass. He was talking about the individuals that were going to show up. In those last days, false Christs and false prophets will rise. Are you ready for this? And they will show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. See, I have told you this beforehand. Wow, that brings just, it brings the pitch home. It just, as we're studying this part, and we see what Jesus was actually referring to, right where we're studying in this chapter, chapter 13. So he's going to, how will he enforce? How, how, how is it that the anti, or the uh, the false prophet is going to enforce this worship? How is it that he will do that? Well, I'm really glad you asked because in verse 17, it gives us a little insight and that no one may buy, sell, except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here, is wisdom. Let him who has understood this calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of man. His number is 666. This is how he's going to enforce it. There you have it, right there. So the false prophet is going to emerge as a religious world leader. It's going to be a one world religion. It's not going to be First Baptist on the corner of 8th and Market and 17th Baptist down at the end of town. It's not going to be First Presbyterian Church. It's not going to be, it's not going to be any, he's going to enforce a one world religion along with this one world dictator. And you can see now just the complexity and how this evil is going to come to pass through this order, Right. So the false prophet will emerge as a one religious world system leader, um, and he's going to coincide with the one world order, which whose leader is the dictator Antichrist. 
So one world religion led by the false prophet and the global dictator politically bringing in idolatry, evil of all sorts is the Antichrist. I want to look as we get ready to close this chapter. There are three aspects of the false prophet that I think are worth us taking a moment and looking at. Um, I'm, I think it's right on your study guide. There's some verses I put alongside. So later on, if you want to go back and look at some of the, the aspects of who he is, you'll know right what verses to go to. First of all, one of the aspects of the false prophet is he has a definitive purpose. He's not just there just doing his evil thing randomly. No, the, everything in Satan's kingdom is purposeful. You know, it breaks my heart. It saddens me even as I'm sitting here talking to you and we're together. So many believers are walking around with, and they don't have purpose. They don't know what their purpose is. They're not, uh, you know, serving in a place of purpose. There's a lot of people who go to church. There's a lot of people who don't go to church, but even the people who do go to church, you know, are you serving somewhere? Do you know what your purpose is? Why God custom made you? You have a fingerprint like nobody else. What is it about you that he has a designed that only you have? You know, you've been fashioned in his likeness, but you've been fashioned in portions of his likeness to do a work for the kingdom. And, and Satan seems to get that better than the church does because he's very, very structured in his systematic um, ways that he does things. And so this false prophet has a purpose. And the purpose is, according to verse 12, to draw attention away from God and to draw attention to the beast. Draw worship. When I say attention, I'm talking worship. So to draw that worship away from God and draw worship to the beast. That's verse 12, very clearly tells us that. His other, The other aspect of the false prophet is that He's got a mission of power. There's, a, there's, a, there's an aspect of him that's powerful. Verses 13 to 15 tell us that. Listen to me, family. I, I, I just want to take a moment here. There are false signs out there. This isn't just in this day and that time that we're studying. Right now, today, as we are sitting here together, there are false signs out there and there's counterfeit power. Don't embrace everything that looks like the miraculous. I, I, I remember in the early days of, you know, coming out of a kind of a conservative background and learning about the gifts of the Holy Spirit and the move of the Holy Spirit. And some of the, the group that I was surrounded by followed these things. You know, they followed these miraculous things and, oh, there's something going on over here and there's something going on over there. You can't embrace everything that looks miraculous. Don't chase signs, in other words. You know, instead, you know, what I learned, and I hope that you already, you know, and if you don't, please take this extremely to heart. Chase Jesus and the signs will chase you. He's not a respecter of persons. The Bible tells us that, you know, those who are truly his disciples, he said, signs and wonders will follow the preaching of the word. Well, Jesus is the word, right? And when we follow him, the signs and wonders will follow us. That's what we can count on for sure. I want you to turn in your Bibles with that in mind over to 1 John. 1 John, there's something very important I want us to see over there. So 1 John 4 says, 4, 1 through 6, I'm actually going to read. And it says, Beloved, and that's you and I, do not believe every spirit. I, I, hope, you, I hope you just heard me. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God, that every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. 
And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of Antichrist. And see, we're, we're seeing exactly what the false prophet and the Antichrist do. They're assuming worship upon themselves. And here John, the very writer of Revelation, is telling us something he knows firsthand by this vision that has been seen that Jesus showed him. And now he's writing this epistle to say, don't believe every spirit because he saw this thing in action, right? He says, because the spirit of Antichrist, which you have heard, was coming is now already in the world. So these lesser antichrists, we talked about that last week, are already there. You are of God, little children, and have overcome them because he who is in you is greater than he that is in the world. They are of the world. Therefore, they speak as the world and the world hears them. We are of God and he who knows God hears us. He who is not of God does not hear us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. What, what, what am I saying in all this? I am saying that one of the aspects along with um, you know, how, the, the power that the Antichrist assumes. Listen, we all have interest in spiritual things. We all have interest in supernatural things. God has made us in such a way that that we we desire those things. We're not fulfilled until we get access to them. And so Satan shows up with these pseudo counterfeit things because he knows God's people were created to need that and have interest in it. But they're not all from God. They're not all from God. Just because there's a big steeple out front doesn't mean it's the church of God. There's been many cults that have shown up. People have drank the Kool-Aid. You know the stories. And even today, unfortunately, there are pastors and teachers who maybe start out well and then get a little bit of pride because of numbers and, and maybe God's giftings upon them. And then they start making things up and start, we just have to be so careful. And, and John says, beloved, don't believe every spirit, but test the spirits test them make sure they are of god in fact matthew 7 i love this and we've read it so often before but matthew 7 let's this is a perfect time to go back and take a peek at that 15 through 23 says this beware of false prophets that come to you in sheep's clothing but inwardly they're raven ravenous wolves you will know them by their fruits See, it's not know them by their signs and wonders. He's saying you'll know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears what? Bad fruit, right? A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown in the fire. Therefore, by their fruits, you will know them. That's what he said. And then here it comes, right out of this, as he's talking about, test the spirits. Know, know what you're sitting under. Know who you're listening to. He goes right into this. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that does the will of my Father in heaven, many, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wondrous things in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. That is straight out of the narrative of testing spirits and knowing who you're sitting under and knowing where you go. And, you know, it, it, church should be empowering and we should leave with some knowledge that we didn't have before. And sometimes we have fun doing that. And sometimes it's an ouch. And I, I, I just feel like today, I think we've, we've lost the fire of holiness in churches. We've lost 
the word sin and altar calls that lay down our sin. And it's all like we only we have to have messages on how to prosper and how to be happy and how to be. You know, no, sometimes being prosperous is putting our sin down and making room more room for Jesus in our lives. Amen. Which is why we had that question last week. What is it in our lives that is taking up a spot that the Lord wants to fill in your heart? fill in your daily activities of your life. Because guess what? Many are going to be deceived. The only way you can't be deceived is to know the truth. The only way you can't be deceived is to know the holiness of the Lord and really spend time with him every day and every single moment. Paul said we should be praying without ceasing, not just have a once a week prayer meeting, but our life should be a fragrance, an absolute fragrance of prayer. Listen, there is a bunch of charismatic people out there. Nothing wrong with that. But it's not charismania Jesus is looking for. It's character. That's what he's looking for. That's what counts. It's fruit bearing. We just read that counts. It's love. In, in a selfie world, it's humility. I mean, I have, I, I just kind of smile. I just is sad. I mean, Believers who just spend so much time taking pictures of themselves. I mean, church, I, I just don't understand. I just really do not understand. We are to draw attention to Christ. True believers want to do that, not to ourselves. In fact, I love this quote by C.S. Lewis, and I believe it's one of your uh, blanks on your page. You know, humility in a selfie world. Let's let's this year one of the ways to soar in 24 is to be less of us because the less of us, the higher we go up. That's exactly what humility is. The more you go down, the greater you come up in the kingdom. In fact, C.S. Lewis said, humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. It's not thinking less of yourself. That's, that's poor esteem in, in, in Christ. It's thinking of yourself less. Do you see the difference? And I just love that wording. I think it's so good. It's not speaking the word and you don't do a thing about it in your own life. It's preaching what you practice. It's not even practicing what you preach. It's preaching what you practice. Listen, the false prophet has the ability here to bring forth signs, wonders, and powers. But let me make it clear. It wasn't from God. Those things were not from God. They were given to him by the dragon from Satan. Fire, fire falling from heaven. And the scripture tells us here in chapter 13, everyone saw it. The whole world saw it, right? Power was given to raise the Antichrist from some fatal wound. And he uses it all to glorify the Antichrist and to glorify the dragon, Satan. Verse 15 tells us he orders an image of Antichrist to be made and set up in the temple uh, is the implication. There is going to be a temple rebuilt. Uh, when this takes place, we know the images, the implication here, and later on we're going to see that it for sure is, but this image of some sort is going to be placed in the temple is what's going to be happening. Let's look at verse 15 again. Um, and it says, he was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many that would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. Now, there's a debate here. Is this the living, true Antichrist that goes into the temple and demands worship? Or is this literally a statue, an image, and the false prophet gives some sort of life to it? We don't really know. No one really knows. There's lots of speculation. We don't know. But either way, there's going to be a, a temple. The, this is going to take place in the temple. The temple will be defiled. And this is what Jesus referred to when he said that when this... Uh, Antichrist is placed in the temple. This is the abomination that brings desolation. Jesus spoke about it again in Matthew 24, 
which Jesus said spoken of by the prophet who? Daniel, right? So we studied Daniel ahead of time for that very purpose. So the false prophet, he has purpose, he has power, and lastly, he has a plan. He's not just wandering around seeing what kind of, you know, havoc he can cause every day. There's a plan in place in verse 16 and 18, as we just read that, work out that plan. Um, he it enforces and and forces and demands everyone take the mark of the beast. That's the plan. Everyone is to receive the mark of the beast, without which, without which, you will not be able to buy, you will not be able to sell anything, you will not be able to buy food, you will not be able to sell off your farm, everything's going to be owned by them, this religious system will be in place, um, and it has brought great speculation throughout time. At this point in time, church, I, I, I can't even believe I'm using these words, but it's what the word tells us, there is going to be satanic worship worldwide. That's what we're looking at here. Satanic worship wor worldwide. Now, I don't know about you, but I remember back in my younger years, you know, teenagehood and whatnot, like you would hear people like Satan worshipers and it would bring a fear upon you. You know, when you would hear that someone was a Satan worshiper, it was something you didn't hear very often, but you would hear it. In my days I, I never thought I would see a time come, I don't know about you, where a man would arise, similar to what's going to happen in these days. His name is Anton Levy. This is the man that wrote the Satanic Bible, okay? This is everything evil we see in this world is coming out of this system. And right here, John gives us a glimpse of what it will look like in that time. But know that it's here now, isn't it? Right now, I mean, who would ever think we'd see a time that cities right outside your back door, only two hours away in, in New York, would have satanic worship days and parades and, you know, and his mission is coming to pass because it's, you don't have to listen to the Bible. This is, this is, you know, do, you do it this way. You know, you don't have to worry. That's old fashioned. This is all the beginning of the one world religious system that is going to defile the word of God, defile anything that has to do with the word of God and put in new things. You know, I, I think I had shared with you before, there's, there's a, there's a movement to make a more correct Bible, you know, more politically correct Bible. We are living, oh my goodness, in just days, I think, you know, my father, even I'm coming up to his, his day of passing next month, I was thinking about the other day, seven years ago, um, he wouldn't believe what, what, what is going on today. The, the labor pains are intensifying like never before. The, the, the acceleration of evil is coming. I'm so thankful to be hidden in the covering of grace. I hope you are too. The number that this beast is going to carry, as we know, is the number 666. Believers, true believers will not take this. You know, I've heard people say there's been remarks about if you took the COVID shot, that's that's the mark of the beast. No, it's not that because we get, know from scripture, and we're going to study more about this as we go through the last half of the book, but um True believers are not going to take this mark. It's not even going to happen to the middle of the tribulation anyway. When all this that we just studied takes place, the image is set forth in the in the temple and whatnot. But believers will not take this. But unfortunately, it's not worth it, my friends, to wait because you won't take the mark of the beast. True believers won't. However, the consequence of not taking it is starvation. The consequence of not taking it is freezing to death. Because you are not going to be able to buy, sell, trade, do any business whatsoever. You'll either be martyred or you will die a very slow, painful death in those days. Six, six, six. Uh, six is the number for man. Uh, mankind was created on day six. 
we don't really know why 666. We can speculate, again, six is the number of man, triple six, you know, one for the dragon, the beast, the, you know, we don't really know. We just really don't know. We we have barcodes we thought were the Antichrist when we would use them. Uh, we we chips of all kinds are in operation right now, even in your credit card. That is not the the six 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 we're talking about. Hey, and doing a little research quickly this week, I found out which I didn't know that they even accused Ronald Wilson Reagan of being the Antichrist because Ronald Wilson Reagan has three names with six letters each. Interesting, right? And here's a good one. Here's a good one. If you take the past election year of 2020 and you divide it by the number Biden used in his campaign as his text number, hmm, yes, it's 0.0666. Now, I'm not saying anything, but I think we're closer than we've ever been with that one. I, scratch that, scratch it. I, I didn't say that. Anyway, here's the good thing. Here's the good news. I don't know why 666 nobody does nobody does but you know what it doesn't matter because i don't plan to be here because the church is going to be raptured before any of this takes place in fact i'm looking for the overtaker and i'm not even looking for the undertaker i'm looking in these days for the overtaker and not the undertaker a amen one thing in closing that just i guess i would say the lord you know showed me thought it was just, I'm still chewing a little bit on it, but, you know, in closing, we said that Satan's dominion always counterfeits the things of God's dominion. And I feel like we could look at this and see, even in this uh, trilogy of the dragon, the beast antichrist, and the beast false prophet, we see three, three supernatural uh, spiritual powers. I won't call them divine. I'll call them spiritual. You know, the dragon was anti-God because he came against Yahweh, even in heaven, right? To, 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 as a worship leader to, to receive worship. The beast, the antichrist is the antichrist. Okay. So we have anti-God as Satan. The antichrist is the 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 example of the counterfeit of Christ. And you know what? I think the false prophet, I believe he's the anti-spirit. He's the anti-spirit because he's going to sway people in their spirit realm to worship a false God. And guess what? That's what the spirit of God does. The Holy Spirit here today never takes any um, acclimate to himself. The spirit always is there to glorify Jesus. And isn't that exactly what the false prophet does? He doesn't take any applause. He gives the Antichrist all of the acclimate. So interesting, isn't it? When you dig a little deeper and see some of these things. Well, the good news is we have the blessed hope. We have the blessed hope that we are not going to be here for the tribulation. We're not going to be here. We're going to be taken out and we're going to be taken out quickly. Uh, the word says in the twinkling of an eye, we're going to be out of here and we are going to be with the Lord forever and ever and ever. And we will forever sit with him and glorify him. And I want to read to you just in closing one last scripture in 1 Thessalonians 4 or five, I should say, verses four to 11. I want to read it in the Amplified, and it says, four to 11, but you are not, but you are not in or given up to the power of darkness, brethren, that that day should overtake you in surprise like a thief. For you are all sons of light and sons of the day, we do not belong either to the night or to darkness. According, then let us not sleep as the rest do, but let us keep wide awake, alert, watchful, cautious, and on our guard. And let us be sober, 
calm, collected, and circumspect. For those who sleep, sleep at night. And those who are drunk, get drunk at night. But we belong to the day. Therefore, let us be sober. Let us put on the breastplate our corset of faith, of love, and for the helmet, the hope of salvation. For God has not appointed us. He has not appointed us to incur his wrath. He did nor select us to condemn us, but that we might obtain his salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us so that whether we are still alive or are dead at Christ's coming, we might live together with him and share his life. Therefore, encourage, admonish, exalt one another, edify, strengthen, and build one, one another up just as you are doing. That's our job. So let's make more room for the Lord. Let's make more room for him to be in our lives. And I, I just would ask right now as we just, just, I just ask you to bow your head for a moment. We're going to end with a song, but I just want to have a little altar time with you together today. So first question is, if you're here, you're listening online, you're there in the church this morning, you're, you're on Facebook. Listen, today is the day of salvation. We do not know when the Lord is returning. I will tell you, it is the season of his return. No one knows the day or the hour, but we are to know the season. And the season is ripe. The season is ripe and the harvest is ripe. Don't put off salvation for another day. And it has nothing to do with what you did. It has to do with what Jesus did. So put aside works, put aside good. You're not good. I'm not good. None of us is good. The only one good is Jesus Christ. And when we receive him and ask him to forgive us and we ask him to come into our life, then he makes us kosher. He makes us good. We can't do it on our own. So, Father, you know, right now, I just lift up anyone who needs to be saved. Lord, I hear these words, and I just ask that you would just repeat after me. Father in heaven, thank you for loving me. Thank you for not turning your back on my sin. Jesus, you are the answer to that sin. I couldn't pay for it by myself. I owed a debt I couldn't pay. And Jesus, you paid a debt you didn't know. I give my life to you. Forgive me for my sin. Use my life for your holy mission and fill me with your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, I ask this. And while our head is bowed and our eyes are still closed, my sisters, where is it? Where is it today that that you're there's some darkness, that there's some things maybe you're holding on to? Is there any unforgiveness? Is there any anything that's taking room in your house that the Lord wants to open the door and take residence in? We got to get ready. We just read what Paul said. Paul just said, be prepared, be ready, always, always have an answer for the hope that lies. We need to be spending more time with Jesus than we ever have before. Get that straight while you're sitting in your chair today. Get it straight. It's a new year, new beginnings. He wants more of you. He wants to love more. The more that we give to him, the more of him we receive. He wants to love you more. He wants to bless you more. He wants to correct you more. But he wants you ready. He wants us ready. So, Father, you know every heart in that room. You know every heart that's listening to this message today. Your very words, Lord. Show, show the family. Show me. Maybe it's something we don't even know. Maybe we've been doing something as a habit for so long, we don't even know we have it. Maybe we, we have a mouth like a dragon. <laughs> Maybe we look like a lamb, but a mouth like a dragon. Maybe it's places we're going. Maybe it's attitudes. Lord, help our attitudes. Because attitude brings altitude. 
show us Holy Spirit, glorify Jesus by showing us where we need to surrender something today. Where is it? Speak to your church. And lastly, I thank you. I think I can thank you for all my family that's listening right now. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for saving us. Thank you for giving us eyes to see your love. Thank you for giving us a heart willing to surrender. And right now, Lord, in the spirit, I touch those, all those cards that many months ago we put names down on who have yet to receive you. We touch them in the power of your love and ask that today would be the day of the salvation of many, that not one of those cards would be lost amongst us, God. We adore you, Jesus. Thank you for this book. Thank you for our brother, John who you revealed all this to. May it not be in vain or time spent in your throne today. And it's in Jesus' name we all ask. And everyone said, amen. Well, if you would stand, um, we are going to close with a song. I think that just goes along perfectly with our prayer. Um, for God to just, just take it all. Give him all of your life in this song. Make this your altar. You know, take my life, take my sin, take my thoughts, take my worries, take my care. Just take, ask Jesus to take us, give it to him today and have him fill you with more of him. And then when that song is over, Jeanette will dismiss you. I love you. I will see you next Tuesday at another faith school. Have a great day.